Some NASCAR drivers have escaped death, and some are very, very lucky. I'm sure some incidents immediately jump to your mind. But I wanted to visit an incident I didn't even know happened. Most of you probably saw when Ryan Priest T-boned Kyle Larson's car at Talladega earlier this year. And look at that damage. Now, imagine if that crash happened in 1976 with the same speed, but the car impacted the driver's side door instead. That would be impossible to survive, right? Well, Skip Manning survived to tell the tale. Right behind Baker, Skip Manning spins in the first turn. Oh! Joe Frasson slams into the driver's side of Manning's car. This is a bad one. The fans from the infield keep their fingers crossed. Right before we get into it, more than 130,000 of you are returning to my channel every month, so if you keep finding yourself watching my videos, make sure you subscribe so you never miss a video, and it helps me out a lot. Now, let's get right into it. Skip Manning was born in Bogalusa, Louisiana in 1945. It is a small town on the border of Mississippi, and Skip started to make a name for himself in racing. From what I can find, it seems like he raced a lot at Jackson International Speedway, a couple hours north of Bogalusa, racing super modifieds and late models in the early 70s and his mid-20s. Skip got a big break when fellow Louisiana native Billy Hagan, a driver and owner, tapped Skip to drive his new Winston Cup car. Hagen was the owner of Stratograph, an oil company. Stratograph funded Hagen's race team and was fully committed to Skip. Skip started just a handful of races in 1975 before attempting almost the entire 1976 schedule. And Skip was doing alright. He was top 20 in standings, but had only collected two top 10s before the 22nd race, the Southern 500. There were a few big storylines heading into the 1976 Southern 500. The day before the 27th running of the race was declared Richard Petty Day in South Carolina by their governor. Petty would also be an honorary judge in the Miss Southern 500 beauty contest that same night. At the time, Richard was the winningest driver of all time in NASCAR in terms of money and race victories, with 177 race victories and over $2.1 million in earnings. Another big storyline was David Pearson, one of the greatest drivers in NASCAR at the time, but he had never won the big show. He had won the Rebel 500, the spring race at Darlington, on six different occasions, but never the Southern 500. It was almost like an Earnhardt Daytona 500-esque rivalry, he just couldn't win the race. Despite this, he had set on pole for the 1976 race, beating his own qualifying record, clocking in at 154.69 miles per hour. There was an interesting qualifying format for the Southern 500 that's worth mentioning. The fastest 12 drivers would lock themselves into the show on Thursday, 12 more on Friday, then the final 16 on Saturday. Then the field of 40 would be set and all ready to go on Monday. Pearson stated before the race, I don't know of any race I'd rather win than this one. He went on to state that my bank account would be a lot fatter if I had six Southern wins rather than Rebel wins. The competitors that would likely give Pearson trouble were the usual suspects. Bobby Allison, Richard Petty, Kelly Yarbrough, and Buddy Baker. An estimated 60,000 fans would show up to watch the Cup Series stars battle it out in the Southern 500 to compete for a grand prize of just over $23,000. And this was a tough track. It is not called the track too tough to tame for no reason. CJ Spencer, starting his 17th Southern 500, stated that this race would be just as hard as the first one he had started. He stated, the driver has to drive here. You can't let the car drive you. Sometimes you just have to shut your eyes when you get to the corner and drive her in there a little deeper. So, let's get into the race. Pearson fell back in the early running, and it was Donnie Allison who looked to have the dominant car of the day. But everything changed on lap 166. Disaster struck for Donnie when the rear end of his car swung around, and he hit the wall hard. After leading about a third of the race to that point, his day was done. Another contender and Yarborough was knocked out of contention when he wrecked exiting the pit lane. About 10 laps later, contender Buddy Baker lost his motor. But right when this happened, on the other side of the track, true disaster was brewing. Skip Manning got sideways and Joe Frasone crashed into his door hard. Turn. Oh! Joe 
Express zone slams into the driver's side of Manning's car. This is a bad one. The fans in the infield keep their fingers crossed, remembering how years ago, Cale Yarborough's car leaped the wall at racing speed, and then how Earl Balmer tore down the guardrail, and how eight cars have crashed in a single wild melee, and no one hurt in any of those thrillers. I mean really hard. Look at this wreckage. Manning was sliding down the track, and Joe was trying to go under him, but ended up T-boning the driver. I mean, Skip was lucky the car didn't instantly crush him. You can see him moving around and all chilled out like nothing happened. But it took officials 30 minutes to free Manning from the car. Manning's left foot was pinned under the mangled metal. Joe Frasone was sort of an established guy at the time. He had 100 starts and 19 top 10s, which isn't bad at all. He was a 40-year-old out of Minnesota. Unfortunately, he came out on the bad end of the wreck. Joe was a true independent, and the wreck ended his season entirely. He only suffered some bruising and was cut, but he too was very lucky to survive. The hit threw his helmet off his head, tore his shoulder harness loose, and gashed his abdomen with his seatbelt. The Rookie of the Year contender Manning suffered a broken leg, but his ride was safe unlike Joe's. Joe would race only six more times in his cup career before moving back to local racing. Joe stated, We were running under caution and I had just told my crew I was going to come in for tires. I got down to number one and there was some smoke coming off the rear of Manning's car. Suddenly, he got sideways and was right across the two lanes of the groove. I was trying to figure out which way to go and I decided to head for the apron. About the time I did that, I guess he got a bite and shot straight down in front of me. I guess we were running pretty close to racing speed. Maybe 125 or 130 miles per hour. I caught him right in the driver's side door. I hit him so hard, it tore my helmet right off my head. I'm sore all over. This wreck not only took the wind out of my cells, it took everything out of my pocketbook. I was just trying to stay out of trouble here today. I guess I'll have to go back to sportsman racing. It took everything I had to rebuild the car after I wrecked at Pocono. So that quote tells a lot. A 130 mile per hour impact to the driver's side door in 1976. Both drivers were very lucky. Skip said that he went into turn one and the back end started to come around on him. He said it wasn't violent or anything, but he just slowly started to head toward the infield grass. But Manning was very unforgiving about the wreck. He stated, I've seen films over and over again, and I can't see how he drove into me like that. Of course, Joe said he had nowhere to go, and Manning was blocking the track. Skip went on to say, that man is a walking accident. He should not be allowed to drive. And Skip had every right to be frustrated, but I think he was being just a little unfair. Of course, it was a bad scenario, and Joe didn't want to hit Skip. Then again, the wreck cost Skip over $25,000 and almost his life. When asked if he had ever leave racing, Manning just stated, Never. It's my whole life. So I'm just thinking of similar crashes to this one. T-bone to the driver's side door. I mean, look at Larry Pearson in 2010. 34 years after Manning's crash, and Pearson was knocked unconscious and broke like four bones and had to undergo immediate surgery. Closer to the time, in 1965, rookie Buren Skeen had his driver's side door slammed into at Darlington as well, but it took his life. They looked like almost the same exact wreck. Tiny London in 1975, just one year before this wreck, was hit in the driver's side door and was fatally injured as well. Even just last season, with as far as technology has come, Carson Hosevar broke an ankle after being T-boned at even lower speed. All I'm saying is, there was a low chance of surviving an impact like this way back then. Cars could fly out of the track and roll, but driver's side impacts were just a whole different beast. So after this wreck, what happened to Skip? Despite the broken leg, he only missed one race, and that was Richmond the next week. But starting at Dover throughout the rest of this season, Manning started the races, and just after a handful of laps, a relief driver would come in to take his place. This allowed Manning to earn the points from the races, which was important because he was around the bubble for 20th place in points and was battling for Rookie of the Year. Both Rookie of the Year and Top 20 in points offered a good payday, and Rookie of the Year was very prestigious back then. 
In the end, Skip would finish in the top 20 in points and win Rookie of the Year, but this did not come without controversy as Terry Bivens was declared the Rookie of the Year winner because he had more top 10s and a better average finish. Combined with Skip missing a lot of races, he was just starting them. But then owner Billy Hagan said he was going to boycott NASCAR if Rookie of the Year wasn't given to Skip, so it was finally given to Skip. That was a big whole mess, but Skip was finally awarded with it. Which was completely fair, he finished higher in standings. After Skip had a career best season in 1977, where he had finished 14th in the standings, 1978 was a really bad one. He announced after the second Talladega race that he was a free agent. Owner Billy Hagan made the decision to replace Manning with Terry Labonte. This was due to subpar performance really, but Manning suggested it was sponsorship issues. Which is weird because his team owner was the sponsor as well, and by next season, Hagen was able to sponsor Labonte most of the races. But looking back, honestly, it seems like it was a good decision by Hagen, as Labonte scored Hagen's only six wins and lone championship as an owner. Manning, shortly after losing his ride, stated that each year the cost of operating a team with a realistic chance of winning has increased drastically. He went on to state that Stratigraph just did not have the advertising budget for it. Which there could have been some truth to this. Maybe Billy Hagen couldn't have slapped Stratigraph on the side of his car every single race for subpar performance. But Manning was excited about the future and stated, I'm still young enough to have a long time left in auto racing and I've proved what I can do. But in the end, Manning would make four more starts in the Winston Cup Series and would never return again. Skip retired from NASCAR racing and returned to Bogalusa with his wife and continued to race. It was hard to find much on his racing career after NASCAR, but here are some pictures of him racing late models in the 80s back at Jackson International Speedway, right where it started. Well, that was kind of a sad ending for Skip in his NASCAR career, right? But I wanted to leave this on a high note. So, who ended up winning the 1976 Southern 500? Well, after passing Darrell Waltrip with just 45 laps to go, David Pearson went on to finally win the Southern 500. After racing in the Cup Series for 18 years, he finally won the big show. Anyways guys, that's it for this video. I hope you did enjoy. If you did, make sure you leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already so you never miss a video. Let me know what you thought of it down in the comments down below, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.